Whenever you hear the word service, what comes to your mind? Many times whenever we hear that, it depends on our own experience. Maybe we think about the different people who provide us with service. Maybe we think about maybe when we're at a restaurant and we receive service from the servers or the waiters or something like that. When they provide us food, they take the dishes away or they do those different things. Or maybe we think about customer service. Those different ways when we are shopping or we're doing something online and we either have to go up to the front desk or we have to call someone to receive some sort of service. Or maybe we think about the services in our life, maybe the streaming services or the different things that we need and we require. That we often think about the ways that we are given something that we need. Something is provided for us, something benefits us in some way. But what does the word service mean whenever it enters into the life of a disciple? Whenever we hear that word and we hear what the gospel and the readings are saying, what is it encouraging us to do? Is it encouraging us to receive, or is it something more than that? To start to answer that question, we should start off with the second book of Kings. Because as we heard the first reading this week, we heard about the story of Elisha and his encounter with this woman of import that we hear about the ways that Elisha often is able to dine with her and with her family, as she, he is often invited to do. But we have to understand the context, because the life of a prophet is often a very difficult one, because they are often having to be provided for. That They have no place to call their own, they have no sort of food that they can come to rely on, so oftentimes they're relying on people's good graces. And so he starts to get that good grace, and he starts to receive those at the hands of this woman. But notice, she doesn't think that this is enough. That she starts to provide accommodations, she starts to provide an abundance of them for him, because she recognizes the importance of his mission, and so she wants to share in her kindness. Elisha notices this, and he in, wants to return that good grace. He wants to return that kindness to her, and so he asks, Is there anything that can be done for this woman? One of her servants answered, well, yes, there is. She's never had an offspring. She's never had an heir. Her husband is up in years, and so it seems very unlikely that she will ever conceive. But Elisha gives this promise. This time next year, you will be fondling a newborn son. That, in fact, that promise comes to term. It comes true because Elisha is prophesying that he wants to give her something in return for the kindness that she has given him. So we see that reality, we see that kind exchange, and what it is to be a people that are generous with one another. We move on and we hear from St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, and this particular moment, he's starting to highlight the grace of baptism, but not in just any sacramental way, but in a very particular way of Christ. He wants to tell how baptism represents what we receive from Christ himself. That Christ, we see these two great things juxtaposed to each other, and yet they're still present in Christ. And those two things are death and life. That we see in his crucifixion that reality of death, how he suffered and underwent death for his people, and that he underwent this reality even though it had no hold on him, and it wouldn't have been a consequence he would have to suffer. He freely underwent that anyway. But then he comes to life again, that he shows that death still has no power over him, but that abundance of life comes to him through the Father, that in fact he even conquers that and brings about life and brings it abundantly. And so that reality comes to us sacramentally in baptism, and St. Paul wants to make that very clear. But it's not just a one-and-done sort of thing. That he in fact wants to paint it out and show that we have to take up that example of Christ, that we can't just simply live in that death and that life just once, but rather it's something that we have to choose time and time again. And he wants the church in Rome to be very aware of that, that there has to be a continual choice towards death, towards sin, and life in God the Father. So he wants the church to be very aware that that baptism happened at one point in time, but we have to be renewed of that at all times. And so he wants to give that message to the church, seeing that great death and life that come to us through Christ Jesus. And then finally we arrive at the gospel according to Matthew. And there's two different parts to this gospel. The first one seems rather harsh, the second one is a little bit easier to understand. But the first one, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me either. 
Whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me cannot be my disciple and is not worthy of me. Whoever saves his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That all of these things seem rather harsh, and they seem that they're hard to hear, and yet the reality is that Jesus knows something that we don't. That each of these relationships that he points out, they are not going to lead us away from God if they are rightly ordered in true love. But if every relationship is rightly ordered, then it is truly going to lead us towards God, our Father. And so he wants to make us aware of that, that nothing is going to lead us away, but rather it should bring us into closer communion and contact with God, our Father. But even the choice to carry our cross, that we have to do that to follow after Christ Jesus himself. But then we see the second part of the gospel, and this is the part that seems rather easy to understand. This invitation to live generously, to receive others, to give others what they need, whether a prophet, whether a righteous man, or even a meek, humble child. That if we truly live in generosity, then we can see that we're not only going to gain the rewards of those that we serve, but we're also going to gain the reward that will last forever, that will never truly be lost. That it's that simple invitation to be generous with one another, to truly be a people at the service of one another, and to see the ways that we can truly devote ourselves and our lives, and we can offer them abundantly to one another as well. But let's get back to that idea of service for just a moment. Because the idea of service, it might seem like something we could simply say that it's something that nice human beings do. That it's people that are gentle of heart. That it's something that they might, can, they might com- commit their life to. But whenever it comes to that reality, isn't there more? Because we look at the prophet Ezekiel, or the prophet as, as we see in the first reading, and we realize that reality, that as we see Elisha and the way that he comes to that woman, and the ways that they exchange, there is a certain level of kindness, there is niceness here, but is it enough to understand it that way? Is it just them being nice human beings? Brothers and sisters, if we just commit ourselves to being nice human beings, it's not enough to get us to the kingdom of heaven. But we look around to the reality of our life as well, and we know that it is very difficult to commit ourselves to generosity and to service because we live in a time of individuality. We live in a time that is focused on number one and how we get ahead ourselves, how we find what we need, how we get what we want, how we find that someone's going to reciprocate something to us. And so we often invest in those things. Or we might even find ourselves in the consumerist mentality, how we can go out and we can find whatever we need or whatever we want, and we have services provided only to us. But that's not the reality of what we're called to do. Because if we see what we're called to do, we need to go back to the second reading. Because Jesus Christ, when he suffers death and comes to life again, he didn't need to do that himself. He didn't need that for his own spiritual good, but rather he needed that for the rest of us. That we were the ones that could not provide for ourselves. We were the ones that needed a service that we could not afford. And Jesus comes and provides that abundantly. And so whether or not we think that God provides for us in his generosity and in his love, he does in all reality, whether we can see it or not that he wants to give us even life itself. He wants to save us from the wages of death and of sin and rather give us life and life abundantly. So the reality of what we see is that we do service not because it makes us look good, not because it makes us seem like kind or generous people, or not just because we've seen other people do it, but because Jesus has first taught us how to be generous. He's taught us how to be a people at the service of others. So when we come to the gospel, it makes sense that he's encouraging us to be at the service of prophets, of other people, and of those that we encounter, even the meekest of all people, and perhaps even those people that we don't get along with very well. Because the reality of the Christian life and what we're encouraged to in our own discipleship is that we are to be a people of generosity, of charity, of service, that are always looking out for the other first and putting our needs to the side. Because if we truly live in the love that is indicated in the first part of the gospel, if we're truly in love with God our Father and of all of the other relationships in our life, then we're going to seek to further others first before ourselves. Then we're going to seek those ways that we cannot live for ourselves or for number one, not for our own vested interest, 
but rather for the interest of others that are in our lives, that we can truly see how we can be at the service of one another. But then that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we need to take concrete action. And that's where I would offer this for homework for every single one of us, myself included. Where can I be a greater person of service? Where am I called to further my generosity right here and right now? Maybe it's in the daily life that we have at work. Maybe we simply do what we feel that we ought to do and that's enough. That what strict justice dictates that we do. But is there a way that we can be more generous? Is there a way that we can go above and beyond the call of duty and we can do so for the benefit of our brothers and sisters? Or maybe if we're looking at home, maybe something much more concrete, much more real, something that we live with day in and day out. Maybe there's a way that we can be more generous with our spouse. Maybe there's a way that we can be at the service of our children or at the service of our parents in a further and deeper way. It's a way that we haven't done it before. Maybe we look at our local community. Maybe we look at the greatness of what we can contribute to that. Or even within our church, maybe we feel that there's a call to go deeper, to go in a relationship not just with our Lord, but with our brothers and sisters, even in this particular community. Because the reality is we are called to so much generosity that we are not called as if we have no idea what generosity is. We simply have to look at the cross and see how our Lord pours out an abundance of, uh, no, abundance of service, of generosity, of charity to each and every one of us. But the question is, and the question I would leave each and every one of us with this week, my brothers and sisters, how are you and I going to further live out that service and that generosity? Because we can be quite easily consumed by taking service for granted, or even taking service for ourselves, living in that individualistic mindset or that consumerist mentality that is so prevalent in this day and in this age. It's quite countercultural to be focused upon others, that we should rather be sacrificing ourselves. We should be looking out for others, especially those that are in most need of that generosity, of that service, and of that charity, so that indeed we can be like Christ and we can pour out our life and pour it out in abundance. Because the true mark of a disciple, there are so many of them, but one of them has to be service and generosity. That we don't live just for ourselves and what we can get out of this life, or what we can extract ourselves, but rather we look for the ways that we can further give ourselves to our friends, to our family members, to our communities that we find ourselves in. And we look for those ways that we're called to deepen our relationship and deepen the ways that we pour out our love. Not just for ourselves, not just for those around us, but for those that need it most. Jesus reminds us how to live generously, and he shows us that very, in a very real way in the cross. My brothers and sisters, let's seek to be a people that are committed to charity, to generosity, and to further service for one another.